that you can find in Union Cemetery here in Crystal Lake. Union, an act of uniting or joining two or more things into one. Union, how perfect the selection of this name to represent our town cemetery. The creation of these now hallowed grounds would need the union of two separate communities, that of Crystal Lake and Nunday, in order to establish the cemetery. The village of Crystal Lake, whose business district was originally located on Virginia Street, was incorporated January 10, 1874. Just to the north, the village of Nunday, whose business district was established in an area we now call downtown Crystal Lake, was incorporated only two weeks later, on January 24th of that same year. These villages, with their close proximity to each other, were natural rivals and definitely disagreed often. But there was one issue that both villages did agree upon. By the late 1880s, there was a need for a new cemetery. Crystal Lake's original cemetery on Lake Avenue was filling up, and options for burial in Nunday were at that time also becoming limited. A collaborative effort between the two villages was needed. On June 1888, each village board selected members to form a committee in order to address the problem. The 10 acres of land agreed upon and then subsequently purchased from a Lyon Hubbard that would become Union Cemetery was centrally located within the corporate boundaries of Crystal Lake, but also in Nunday Township. $750 was contributed by both villages toward the total purchase price of $1,500. A union was forged between the two villages, and Union Cemetery was born. Soon after the establishment of Union Cemetery, plans were underway to erect a monument paying tribute to the veterans of the Civil War. A memorial topped with the likeness of a Union soldier was selected to become the central focal point when entering the tree-lined drive of Union Cemetery. A soldier to represent the brave men from both villages who participated in the war to preserve our nation's Union. A Union soldier that stood proud as citizens for the next 100 years marched to the statue's base on Memorial Day to remember not only those who fought for the Civil War, but then also subsequent wars and conflicts, honoring all those who have served our nation. The soldier statue had a very important role as it stood watch over our Union Cemetery, not unlike the duties of a sentry during the Civil War. Guard duty was the most important responsibility in the military for it's a sentry who prevents the destruction of vitally needed military supplies. The guard protects public and private property. And most importantly, a sentry protects his comrades as they rest, or in this case, laid to rest. Guard duty during the Civil War was highly structured. The entire procedure from patrolling to personnel chosen for guard duty to the relief was a formal affair. The removal of our beloved statue from Union Cemetery was also marked with a formal guard relief ceremony on November 10th, 2006. In no way was our soldier formally discharged from his duty, but instead getting in leave as he was placed into storage while funds could be raised for his restoration. So many years. He had faithfully stood guard. So many seasons of freezing, expanding, and thawing had finally taken its toll. The dangerous backwards lean that our soldier statue had developed forced him to be temporarily relieved of his appointed duty. This problem is not unique to our Crystal Lake Memorial and is actually happening to commemorations throughout the United States made of a material known as white bronze. Although called white bronze, the metal of these material memorials is actually a non-magnetic metal commonly known as zinc. Zinc develops a protective coating when exposed to air, which gives these memorials their characteristic bluish hue. 
commemorations were produced by a company known as the Monumental Bronze Company and its subsidiar subsidiaries. The company produced public memorials as well as headstones from this material from 1874 through 1914, with its peak sales occurring in the 1880s, which is when our Union Cemetery Memorial was purchased. The company advertised white bronze as a metal that would never blacken or grow dingy like that true bronze, moss would not adhere to the surface, and it would not chip or crumble like that granite, it was actually billed as a superior product during the time period. These white bronze monuments were sold through catalogs and sales agents. The parent company, the Monumental Bronze Company, was located in Bridgeport, Connecticut. The casting of the individual sections of the memorials were done there, and were primarily done in Bridgeport, and then these sections were then shipped to their subsidiaries throughout the country. The sections were then fused together by pouring molten zinc into the joints, which made it stronger than if they had been soldered. These incinerators were open throughout our country, one of which, the American Bronze Company, was located right here in the Chicagoland area and is the subsidiary responsible for our Crystal Lake Memorial. The price of these memorials was much less than stone. One of the reasons was due to the reduced shipping cost. A town can actually erect a larger monument for their hard-earned fundraising dollars by going with one made of white bronze, and many of them did. A catalog of the Monumental Bronze Company in 1882 lists the price of the soldier option in order to top the commemoration. The number 22 statue of an American soldier was six foot, one and a half inches tall, and it was $450 and they would actually customize the face for you if you supplied a picture of the deceased soldier, and that was an extra $150. I have located several zinc soldier statues like ours in Crystal Lake during my cemetery travels. Most are used to top public memorials, but they can be found occasionally marking the graves of individuals, as has been done with the soldier that I located in Belleville, Illinois. but I have yet to find one with a customized face. <laughs> Unfortunately, styles and tastes of the public changed, and the material fell from popularity. The Monumental Bronze Company continued to produce memorials until World War I. The factory was then taken over by the government to manufacture gun mounts and ammunition, and it never fully recovered. It only re uh, produced replacement plates during its, fi during its final years of operation. On March 11, 1939, headlines finally proclaimed statues the world over keep live, name of closed monumental firm. Oh, those are the those are the customized, the non-customized faces. <coughs> the one in the middle is our Crystal Lake Memorial. The smaller headstones made of zinc are in comparatively good shape after over 100 years of exposure to the outdoor elements. These photos are of white bronze headstones located in other cemeteries. There are no personal headstones made of this material in our Union Cemetery. The larger memorials topped by the soldier statues, though, are many times having the same difficulty that we experienced in Union Cemetery. One of the unfortunate problems not anticipated when these memorials were being produced was creep. Zinc, unfortunately, deforms under its under its own weight over time. The American soldiers that top the memorials often sink into the base at their right heel, causing the soldiers to have either a backwards or sideways lean. I discovered this white brown soldier placed in Old Augusta Cemetery in Augusta, Illinois, having the same right heel sink problem, which caused a <coughs> sideways lean to their memorial. The multi-tiered white bronze bases are also subject to structural problems resulting from creep. Stress cracks form and outward bulges occur on these bases. Pictured here are bases that I've discovered in other cemeteries displaying damage from this creep. These problems have only become evident now as the memorials are aging and not anticipated when this product was being billed as superior to either bronze or granite. Though missing the soldier figure from 2006 to 2012, 
The white bronze base remained in our Union Cemetery. The foundation was surrounded by a beautifully designed concourse consisting of commemorative bricks purchased as a way of procuring funds for the restoration. The concourse was sponsored by the American Legion William Chandler Peterson Post No. 171 and dedicated on Veterans Day in 2009. All in Crystal Lake anxiously anticipated the day when our beloved soldier statue would return to his position. The long-awaited day finally arrived on the beautifully sunlit morning of June 8, 2012. A time capsule was filled with documents and photos of the memorial's restoration and then placed within the base on November 11, 2012, which was the first Veterans Day since the soldier had been returned to his watchful position. The photos you have, were, that you viewed in the previous slide are some of the collection that was placed into the time capsule. The time capsule will be opened on September 11, 1889, which is the 200th anniversary of the Soldier Memorial's dedication. <coughs> now let's examine the memorial's base, which displays a wealth of information and symbolism. An issue of the Woodstock Sentinel dated September 19, 1889, describes our beloved commemoration, and I quote, Artistic in design and a model of beauty, it is one of white bronze and stands 18 and a half feet tall. The base is six foot square of rough ashlar. Upon the second and third bases are inscribed the names of the soldiers still living. On the fourth faces of the plinth are placed the names of the following battles. Gettysburg, Shiloh, Vicksburg, and Stones River. The front tablet of the die records the dedication, the right, the names of those killed in action, the back, those who have died in service, and the left, those that have died since the war. This article was published after the dedication ceremony on September 11, 1889, which was in accordance with the GAR ceremonial rites and was attended by approximately 2,000 people. The base also is embellished with decorations of a symbolic nature, the most recognizable of which are stacked cannons, pro stacked muskets, crossed cannons, crossed sabers, and anchors, representing the four branches of the service. Surrounding these designs is the letter Omega, which is the 24th and last letter of the Greek alphabet. The use of this letter denotes the last, the end, or the ultimate limit of the set. One final item on the memorial's base is worth mentioning. The American Bronze Company many times embedded its name into the foundations of the larger memorials and headstones. The company's designation is located on the back of the commemoration to the left. This error in typesetting has always given me reason for a chuckle. From its conception, our town cemetery has been an example of unification, union of our two towns, union of our country, but also the union of the diverse ethnic population that settled into our Crystal Lake area. Many reasons can be attributed to the influx of these immigrants from employment as craftsmen in the terracotta industry to religious freedom. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, there were 613 households living in Crystal Lake in 1920. The birthplaces for each head of household are represented in the following data. Many residents by 1920 that were considered U.S. born in this study are actually just first generation born of U.S. immigrant parents. As the population passed on, making way for their children, the remains of the immigrants would be placed into our Union Cemetery. Again, the definition of Union perfectly describes these hallowed grounds. The immigrants didn't segregate their dead into sections of the cemetery according to nationality, but instead buried throughout. 
This illustration, shows, this illustration shows an ongoing project of mine. As of now, I have identified 164 of 